stay with the group, sir. You, I mean, you're going to have to swap Junior over, aren't you? <laughs> I'll pass the glasses round, then uh, if you have pass a look through them and then pass them around so everybody can have a look. These are females, so these are lighter colour, lighter build, with horns that curl inwards and backwards. It's called a lyre shaped horn. See how they curl? The males, that's a male, darker colour, bigger build, horns that come forward for fighting. Yeah. So when he gets aggressive or defensive, down comes his head. Mm. And that's the bit that comes to me. Probably this little part here in the middle, and that one at the far side, on its own, are the younger ones. There's uh, two calves which are about two to three weeks old. And then there's one that I've just found which has probably only just been born maybe a day or two. Over there, right, 800 years now they've been in here. Henry III passed the first enclosure act in 1235, and Chillingham Castle, which is just behind those trees, they built a seven mile stone wall around their back garden between 1240 and 1260. And that created a hunting park. And in there, they enclosed animals to hunt. Obviously, you've got a hunting park, you need food. So they enclosed wild cattle, wild deer and wild boar. That was a food supply and hunting uh, was entertainment as well as food. Before the enclosure, these lived in the forests. These are the last remnants of indigenous wild cattle. They didn't belong to anybody. And we looked like that a thousand years ago. We were covered in broadleaf trees and these lived in a forest that ran from North Yorkshire to the Clyde Valleys in Scotland. An enormous area. Once they enclosed them in here, it suited the people in the castle to leave them wild. There are two main reasons for that. First was the hunt. It's much more exciting to hunt a wild animal than a tame one. These guys are half a ton of bone and muscle with a big set of spikes on the front. If you want entertainment, they will oblige. If you upset them by chasing after them on horseback with dogs, they'll fight you. We know from the history books in the castle they kill horses, dogs and men. The main reason for leaving them wild was so that nobody could steal them. So close to the border, in those days, everybody stole everything that wasn't nailed down. And um, cattle were the first thing that would be stolen. As soon as you domesticated cattle, they were gone. Now these won't herd or drive, so you can't pinch them. <laughs> they just won't go with you. Mm. And having a herd of cattle that couldn't be stolen in this part of the world in those days was a valuable asset. So they kept them wild. Now the way they kept them wild gives us what we have today. Because they didn't bring any other cattle in here to mix with them. So for the 800 years they've been enclosed in here, they're purebred. Because they're purebred, they've only bred with the animals inside the wall. That means they're inbred for the same 800 years. Mm. This is the longest inbreeding regime known to man. Now as humans, we think about the weaknesses of inbreeding. But nature's controlled this, thank God, not humans. So we have in here systems that help. First of all, we have this king bull system where all the bulls fight each other and only the fittest and strongest bull ever gets to breed. So we have this king bull and he'll reign over the herd for up to three years. Never beyond, but up to three years. In his three years, he fathers all the young. That gives us strong genes only going into the herd. Now the clever bit. The females can't have their first calf until they're four. Which means his three year period as a boss has always finished before his own daughters can conceive. Nature leaves a natural genetic break in between a father and a daughter. It's very clever. The same thing applies to his sons. They're sexually mature at about 18 months to two years old. They just don't weigh enough to fight these big fellas until they're six years old. So a son is never in a position to take over from his own father as a king bull. That gives us a natural break between a father and a son. And the third thing is to do with the calves. If they find a calf they consider weak, they kill it. And they kill it when it's introduced to the herd, which is anything between one and eight weeks old. What they're doing in effect is they kill the weakness, they don't want it. If you put all these things together over 800 years, 
we now have the most inbred mammals on Earth and they have no genetic weaknesses or recessive factors left in them. That's what nature can do when a clever old man leaves it alone. So it can work, inbreeding can work, providing you're ruthless <laughs> and get rid of weaknesses as it goes along. Now the males, darker colour, because they're covered in mud and poo basically, that's why they're a dark colour. They dig holes like this, this is what we call a fighting pit. And the bulls gouge the ground out, mess in it and cover themselves in that. They flick it all over, push their faces in there. What that does is co bring, covers them in their own smell. So when they fight, they touch the other bull, they put their smell on the other bull and that's dominating. The males are also a much more muscular animal and they have horns which come forward to do what these two are doing. These are just playing at the moment. But you can see they fence with their horns. And um, when they're fighting for real, their heads will move so quickly you can't see their horns. So they get lots of injury around the heads and shoulders and things like that. The females, they don't cover themselves in mud and poo, so they stay lighter coloured. They're a physically lighter build. They have no social graces at all, as you can see from this girl here. And um, their horns have an inward and backward curl to them, called a lyre shape. Doesn't mean they can't fight. If you get near her car, she'll cut you in two. She might look lovely, <laughs> but she's absolutely not. Now, what we can't do is touch these, and there's obvious reasons for that. If I can touch her or him, they can touch me not a clever place to put yourself, it's far too close. This is about as close as you want to be. The other reason is smell. If we handle one of these, as this gentleman said earlier, if we touch one, we change the way it smells, they'll kill it because it's no longer who they recognise. So no veterinary care for these at all, no physical contact. So they get no injections or lotions and potions, no treatments, no help with birth, no live testing. I'll work with these hopefully until I retire and I'll never touch one. It's quite bizarre when you're thinking about livestock. Now at the moment in the herd is 108, possibly 109. That's the highest number we've recorded since 1692. That's when our records go back to. <coughs> the lowest number recorded was 13. And that was after a, a, a winter in 1947, a terrible winter when the snow ended up six to eight feet deep and the snow drifts were 40 to 60 feet deep and that was on the ground for four months. Hell of a winter. These things were starving and the snow was too deep for man to get through to feed them. The tractors just couldn't move. So what they did to keep these alive, they flew an old airplane over here and threw out some hay, hoping that these would survive. And of course natural selection kicks in. The fittest and strongest pushed through the snow, got to the hay and lived and the weakest 